Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the world of 2050. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself and uh, uh, from there why you can get a, a, a little bit of where I'm coming from on some of this stuff. Life for me has been a big adventure. I'm enjoying it and my motto is, hang on here. I've been there, I've done that, and while I was doing it, I took notes. <laughs> and to give you a little feel for that, why uh, in the 1960s, I uh, <clears throat> was at several different schools uh, and I was also a soldier for three years. One of those being an all expenses paid vacation to Vietnam. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> but the following year brought me to Utah. I was born and raised in Ohio and always was curious about this strange little lake sitting way over on the west side of the United States. And when I came here, why, wow, I found that not only was there this strange lake here, but lots of great scenery, and I'm a photographer, uh, easy roads to drive on, I love driving, and very friendly people. So, wow, this all worked out very well. And uh, when I uh, <coughs> graduated, sorry, when I ended my tour in the Army, uh, I wanted to go to MIT, and I had wanted to go out of high school, and out of high school I had made it to the waiting list, but hadn't gotten in. And when I reapplied, they said, well, you're clearly interested, get some good grades, and in you come. Where do I get the good grades from? We don't care, just get some good grades. So, continuing my adventure in, in seeing new and different places, I went to Dixie College. Who here knows where Dixie College is? There you go. This was, again, in the 1970s. And back then, why St. George was just a little place. Who's been to St. George? There you go. It was still in between the Black Rock Cliffs at that point. And sitting on top of one of them was the airport. City was nestled in it. So it was still deeply southern Utah at that point. And I got another culture under my belt. From there I went to MIT. I studied chemical engineering. And I got Boston culture under my belt. Ugh. But <laughs> night and day different, and I'm real happy that those four years are all over. <laughs> MIT itself, by the way, was a wonderful place, full of very curious, very cooperative people. And again, the moral of this is that different colleges do have different cultures. So do pay attention to that. And uh, 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 MIT itself I enjoyed, and Boston, uh, I can, I can I'm happy I'm back in Utah. From there, I had a degree. What do you need next? Job. You need a job, yay, <laughs> okay. So, uh, my first job was a for real chemical engineering job, yay. I worked in Los Angeles making O-rings. Who here has heard of an O-ring? Like beach rings? Like What's an O-ring? Uh, are you talking about like O-rings for like vehicles? Like those? How uh, they're seals? There you go. Essentially it's a rubber washer. Yeah, yeah. By the way, my hearing is very bad. If I'm doing this, if I'm acting like an old grandpa, <laughs> Why, it's because I don't hear very well, and uh, help me out uh, if, if I'm not understanding you. By the way, 
ask questions. I'm, I'm very open to questions and, and love hearing from you. So, okay. So, Los Angeles, yay. Chemical engineering, yay. And what else is in Los Angeles? Movie making. I happen to uh, live in West LA and work in Culver City, which meant I was going through movie lots. And one of the memorable things about that was somebody was filming King Kong. And looming over the high wall of the movie lot was the gorilla. So yeah, Los Angeles, very interesting. But <clears throat> I decided to try something different. So I got into rocket science. Yay, which took me back to Utah. And who here is familiar with, uh, I think it's called L3 now. OK. Where is it? Do you know? No, I don't. OK. North of Brigham City. Actually, west of Brigham City. North of the Great Salt Lake. And so I was busy working on rockets there, one of them being the space shuttle. And making life even more interesting, I was living in Salt Lake. And every so often, I would get in a plane, and I would fly over the Great Salt Lake, land at the VIP airport at uh, L3, go to work, come back, and fly home. I ended up with a commercial pilot's license. So yeah. OK, but there was a problem. Rocket fuel is very dangerous. So if you're going to mess with rocket fuel, what do you have to be? Careful. You have to be crazy. very <laughs> crazy. There you go. You have to be very safe or you are crazy. OK. So you have to, you know, you get a, a list that says do X check. Do X2, check. And somebody else is sitting there saying, did you do X? Check. Did you do X2? Check. Oh, it was, for, as far as I was concerned, it was so dull. So it was fun to say, yeah, I'm a rocket scientist. But as far as the work went, uh. so I migrated and had been reading about the wonderful world of integrated circuits and something new coming out of that. What was new in late 19, or in 1977? Anybody know? Computers. Huh? Computers. Not computers, but home computers. There you go, personal computers. At that time, they were called microcomputers. They later evolved into personal computers. Yes. OK. Lots of excitement. And if something goes wrong on a personal computer, hit the reset button and start over. Yeah, baby. So this suited my, my feelings about how to work much better. So I'm a personal computer pioneer and followed that with what are called local area networks. Who's heard of a local area network? What's a local area network? <laughs> there you go. This, this is a land. There you go. Good. This is, by the way, is one of the characteristics of high technology. Uh, it changes so fast. <laughs> so local area networks were one of the first ways of tying various personal computers together when they were lo located close to each other in a room or in a building. This predated the internet. And the, one, the company that was uh, involved in this was Novell. Who's heard of Novell? So I was one of the tw first 20 people hired for Novell. Uh, worked for them off and on for 10 years. And why don't you hold up surfing the high-tech wave? 
This is the history of Novell for its first 10 years. There you go, there you go. From there, another change. I became a teacher and I was teaching about computer networking and in Korea I was teaching English as a second language. Adding more cultures to my belt here. Learning a lot about more people. And these days I do a lot of writing. And I also write movie scripts. So yeah, I'm having fun. Did you work on the O-ring issue? Sorry, did you work on the O-ring issues for the, uh, the Challenger while you were at? <laughs> no, <laughs> fortunately for me. <laughs> uh, that came up uh, about four years after I left. Now, I was there to see the first uh, static test of a space shuttle booster, but that O-ring issue uh, uh, came up later. But good point. Good. And if you want to know more about it, I can talk about it. Good. Okay, basically we're going to talk about two things today. We're going to talk about how life works in the high technology industries. And we're going to talk a bit about one of my favorite, current favorite topics, what's coming. And this is the near future, and this is what I think is going to be our real future. And this again is, if you're in business, why this is going to be very important. This is why we're talking about it. Okay. Okay. If you're in high technology, and particularly and if you're in the marketing side of it, which I was in, the sales and marketing side, two questions come to mind. An engineer comes to you and says, I got a hot product. And as a marketing people, what is my response? What does it do? <laughs> what, did, what does it do? What does it do? What is it good for? There you go. That's the first question. Okay. And it's the constant question because, again, high tech keeps changing all the time. Computer, what's it good for? Okay, so the answer essentially comes in two broad categories. The first answer is I'm going to replace an existing technology and I'm going to do it faster, better, and cheaper. This is the commodity use. This is what's going to get the new technology started. This is what is going to convince investors that this is worth spending some money on, this is worth building. After the product is being made and it's being used for a while, then if it's a hot product, you get the surprise use. You can do that with it too? Neat! And this is the world-shaking use. This is the one that will make history. Okay? Who here has heard of killer apps? Okay, another term for that. Okay. So, I'm going to give some examples from my background, computers. Way, way back, which in the day in computer industry times means back to the 1940s. <laughs> what was the first use, or one of the very first uses for a digital computer? Okay, computing tra artillery trajectory tables. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, you've got a cannon. Targeting system. It's essentially the targeting. There you go. You shoot. It's gone this far. How far has it dropped? You've gone this far. How far has it dropped? That's what the artillery table is all about. Mind-numbing arithmetic. Okay? Very simple, very repetitive. If it's very simple and very repetitive, let's get a computer to do it. Yay! So this was essentially the first use for it. 
Okay, what's another use that, that got, got into a movie recently? Code breaking. Code breaking? There you go, code breaking. Once again, try an A, see if that will solve the code. Try a B, see if that will solve the code. Mind-numbingly simple. But you just got to do an awful lot of it. Okay, uh, once those got started, again, this was the commodity use for it. What was the surprise use? Mind-numbingly simple accounting. Okay, and these were big and expensive machines, so who could afford them? Big and expensive organizations like the Department of Defense. But they made such a difference that for a brief period of about five or ten years, Department of Defense actually was more efficient at its accounting than big businesses. Whoa, not, not a very common situation. My father commented on it and said, this is strange. <laughs> okay, time passes. <clears throat> because computers are very popular, the technology improves. Next we have solid state, we have transistors. And what's the first use for transistor-based computers? It's making faster, better, cheaper mainframe computers. Same ones, doing big business accounting. After they got established, then you get mini computers. And mini computers are functioning a bit differently than mainframes are. This is when you start to get things like terminals and modems, okay? And who can use these that could not use the mainframes? Medium-sized business, okay? Much bigger marketplace. And the surprise use for this was business guys who said, hmm, you've got a business, you've got a business, you've got a business. Okay, I'm buying your business and I'm gonna put my mini computers in. I'm buying your business and I'm putting my mini computers in. I'm buying your business and I'm putting my mini computers in. Okay, and your businesses work better, but they're all different. This became what were called conglomerates. So this was a surprise use of the technology, creating a new style of business called conglomerates. Who's heard of them? Not much anymore these days, right? Okay, once again, technology keeps changing and how we live keeps changing. Okay, then we have integrated circuits. So we had a mainframe, we had a mini, what do we have now? We have a micro, okay. Does that work the same as the mini computer? To start with, yeah, you just make a mini computer with integrated circuits. But, what's the surprise use of that? Everybody can own one. There you go, personal computers. Whoa, is a mini computer like a personal computer? Yeah. Not much, not when you're using them, okay? And what was the surprise use of personal computers? Ding, 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 ding. Okay, computer games, yay. Also word processing and spreadsheets. These were all killer apps for personal computers. Have they changed how we live? Oh baby, oh baby. This is the nature of high technology. Something comes out new and it really is going to change how we live. And likewise, the old stuff tends to get forgotten. Okay, Who's, who, who has handled a floppy disk? <laughs> Congratulations, you're all old timers. <laughs> so again, this is the nature of high tech. Personal experience, Novell. When Novell was created, the founders of Novell said, Utah has cheap labor, Utah has highly educated people, we're gonna make a printer. We're gonna make 
a terminal. Okay. Didn't work out terribly well. The first guy that they brought aboard to be the president said, we're going to make a personal computer. Worked out a little bit better, but not good enough. Novell grew to 100 people in a year, and none of the above were making money. Crisis. Okay, became what I call the time of six presidents. Are you going to make it work? Uh, uh, are you going to make it work? Uh, uh, okay, pretty nearly finished it off. But finally, the hero came. Yay! Who here has heard of Ray Norda? Okay. <laughs> Ray Norda turned it around. And he turned it around because one of the things that had been worked on while all of this was not working was the local area network. And that worked. It worked big time. Okay, Nor Norda came on board in 1983. By 1989, the company had a billion in sales. It had started the local area network industry, and it had created an industry standard. Yeah, worked big time. Okay, so the lesson about this one is, if it doesn't work, try, try again, think it over, Look at what your marketplace wants. That's the critical issue. What is it that the marketplace is willing to pay for? Okay, Apple. Who's heard of Apple? Who's heard of the Apple II? There we go. What made the Apple II special? The color screen? Yeah. No, actually the color screen was a TV. Oh. But this was, again, clever work on the part of Jobs and Wozniak. We can, we can build an expensive screen or we can put an adapter on so that you can connect into your TV and save us the expense of building a display. What else? What made the really big difference? Keyboard? Was it the keyboard? No, not the keyboard. Or the mouse? Mouse. The mouse. It, Touch screen? First ones did not have mice. I'm thinking back a little bit. No, not yet. That's, that comes with the Macintosh. Trackball. Ball. Was it a ball? Trackballs? Nope. What made the big difference was the marketplace. Who, who did many computers sell to? Medium-sized businesses. Who did the Apple II sell to? Consumers, schools. People, mostly computer hobbyists, okay, who originally were ham radio hobbyists. And what do these people want to do to a computer? Modify it. Modify it, there you go. They want to tinker. They want to build boards. They want to program it. Okay, This was a brand new marketplace, and it took a brand new way of thinking about computers. The older mini computer people were busy saying, software? Yeah, we'll make it for you. Hardware? Oh, yeah, yeah, we can make it for you. Okay, But that's not what this new marketplace wanted. The new marketplace wanted to tinker. That's what put Apple on the map. What took it off the map? Licensing. Software licensing. Software licensing. Okay, there you go. What took it off the map was it grew and it hired a bunch of mini computer experts. And the many computer experts brought their old habits. We're going to lock it up. Okay. So the Macintosh, build a daughter board for the Macintosh. Ha, 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 ha. Okay. Build software for the Macintosh if you license. Okay. What happened to Apple? It became a niche 
company. It was serving very, just a small marketplace, very concerned with graphics. Okay? This, by the way, happened as Jobs left. What happened when Jobs came back? It opened up in a completely new area. What was the completely new area? Music, iTunes, okay? So they let people share again. Now, they are not quite as open as they were in the old days, but they're much more open than they used to be. Who is the open system for smartphones? Android. Android, Android. there you go. That's why Android prospers. The next lesson of high technology. You want to make money for years at a time? Make a standard. Make a standard that people are going to use. Okay? If you make a product, it's going to last three to five years. You're going to have to come up with a new product. Who's facing this right now? GoPro. 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 Who? GoPro. <laughs> GoPro. There you go. Um, uh, GoPro, Samsung, Apple have to keep coming up with new iPhones. Okay? GoPro has to keep coming up with new cameras. Again, products keep getting replaced. But Microsoft operating system goes on and on. Microsoft, who's using Microsoft Word? Is Microsoft happy that you're around? Oh yeah, okay. So standards tend to last longer than products. If you can create a standard and get people using it and keep control of the standard, that's a key to long-term success. Yeah? How do you keep up on uh, new technology? How do you <laughs> Uh, it's work, and what I do is find things to stay interested in. Now, contemporarily, I don't keep up much anymore. So, for instance, I don't have a cell phone. Uh, sorry, I have a cell phone, but I don't have a smartphone. Okay, I signed up on Twitter, but I don't use it. Okay, so uh, the last major thing for me was picking up on the internet and learning how to program in HTML. So for me, start with MS-DOS, migrate to Windows, migrate to Macintosh, uh, uh, move on to local area networks in various incarnations, get to the internet, and after that, teach English. <laughs> it's a standard and it's lasted a lot longer. So, uh, but yeah, you have to continually, you have to plan on continually updating and try to be smart about what you update into. So for me, why new technology is Canvas. I'm trying to keep up on that. Okay. As I have witnessed a lot of things and a lot about technology changing, uh, one of my old interests came back. And that old interest was reading science fiction. But it came back in a different way, writing science fiction. So I basically read everything I wanted to read. I want more, I want more. So I started writing it. And I write what I, being a marketing type guy, I write what I call techno fiction, which is uh, basically sort of like golden age science fiction. It's an awful lot about technology and its ramifications. And this book is even more about the ramifications and with less fanciful stuff. Much of it is real stuff. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about now. So, out of the many things that, th that we could talk about, we're going to talk about driverless cars, wearables and pervasive surveillance, and 
Cyber Muses! Yay! Okay, my term. Any questions? Okay. Driverless cars. What is a driverless car? Let's start with basic definition. There you go. There you go. Is it easy to do? Probably for the not. I mean, they've taken a long time to program it to do all the different scenarios. But for the person sitting there letting it happen, it's really hard for them. <laughs> so, very different. And up until you get really pervasive computing power and small sensors, really hard to do. We're still working on it, but boy, is it exciting. And what does it promise to do? Basically, the concept is the car is going to drive itself, and what's going to, what, what are the, what's the commodity use that that's going to produce? Well, like you have up there, it'll, I mean, it's going to be really good for a lot of people. For example, um, older people, people with disabilities. Um, it's just going to be able, they'll be able to go a lot of places. There you go. There you go. Good. It's going to open up your time. It's going to open your time up for other things rather than focusing on driving. Very good. Very good. Okay. Anything else? It's going to reduce traffic congestion a lot. You don't have to have stoplights once you've got pure driverless, that is. Okay. So those are the major things that people have thought of. And again, my hobby is thinking about ramifications, so I'm, ah, ah, and, and if people don't have to drive the car, what else changes? Change of ownership. If you're just going to get into the car and it's going to take care of itself, why bother to own it? Just get a taxi. Walk outside, get in the car, go somewhere, you get out, and the car goes off and services somebody else. Okay. Change of ownership. If I'm not driving the car, why learn to drive? Okay, and what is driving today? What is learning to drive today? I'm a teenager. I just learned how to drive. I'm a real person. Yay! You want to go on a date? I can drive us. Yay! Okay, so it is a rite of passage. A rite of passage, and we're going to lose that as a rite of passage. Something else will replace it. Okay. And as I mentioned, how we think about cars is going to change. I'm not going to think much about a car until I'm ready to walk out the door. And doo -doo 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 -doo. I've thought about it all I need to. It's going to show up, I get in it, and I... It's a piece of furniture, like a chair, okay? This is change coming. And this is going to change what, what's going to be, what's go, what is a major change that this is going to make in American business? Car dealerships. You're not going to sell cars to people much anymore. Now, are cars going to go away as completely as a floppy disk? Why not? People like to drive. There you go. Okay. So, people like to drive. It is a form of personal expression. And this is a concept that I have written about that I call tattoos and t-shirts. Okay. Where this comes from was watching a documentary on Stone Age people in Borneo. And the explorer was asked, what's the first thing these Stone Age people want from civilization? And the answer that came back to my surprise was t-shirts, fancy t-shirts. 
It's a way of decorating your body, like a tattoo. But this is high technology. It's colorful. You can put it on, you can take it off, you can wash it. Wow. So it's a high-tech version of a tattoo, but tattoos haven't gone away. So this is because they are personal expression, and likewise, cars like horses are going to be personal expression. They'll still be around, but very much more limited in what people do with them. Pervasive surveillance. There is an awful lot of talk. We're going through it right now with Apple and the FBI, okay, about how spooky pervasive surveillance could be. But we're going to see an awful lot of it. And the reason we're going to see an awful lot of it is because it makes things work so much better. If you have pervasive surveillance, you can see when something stops working right away. And you can send something out to fix it right away. This is physical things like a room and our bodies. Okay. <coughs> My heart stopped beating. Who's going to know about it? My wearables are going to know about it right away. <coughs> so something can be done about it very quickly. So again, physical bodies and or physical layout and our bodies as well, we're going to see an awful lot of pervasive surveillance. So once again, if you're planning on a business, plan on pervasive surveillance. Okay, another Roger expression. Who here worries about the climate? Okay. Efficiency is green. Why? Why is efficiency green? Because you're not wasting. Okay? If I can make this book 50%, we're using 50% less paper, I'm saving the world's resources. Okay? Efficiency is green. Effectiveness is even greener. What's effectiveness? Effectiveness is doing it the right way the first time, <laughs> or at least the common times that you do it. Okay? So, once again, these are ways of reducing waste that are not well recognized. Okay? So, keep this in mind. If you get more efficient, you're being green. You're not wasting resources. If what you design is working well, doing its job well, that's even greener because you're not, once again, you're not wasting. Okay. So once again, issues of privacy and issues of, of supporting 1984 scenarios, they're going to be small potatoes compared to getting things done more efficiently and more effectively. We're, we're close to done. This is the last item here. Relating to this is automation. We're going to see a lot more automation in our mass production. This is going to make a really big difference. Why? You lose jobs. Jobs are gone. Very good. We're going to, those kinds of jobs, the industrial age, factory jobs, the robots are going to take over, okay? But once again, very efficient, very effective. So, they are going to start designing the above as well. Uh-oh, the engineering jobs. The robots are going to take the engineering jobs. Oh no, oh no. Okay, one of the changes that this is going to bring about is money. If the robots are designing the factories and the robots are running the factories, they are going to be making investment decisions. And that style of money, I call investing money, is 
not going to be something that humanity pays much attention to. Okay, robots are going to do it all. Okay, we are going to have what I call the total entitlement state. Who here has heard of the worker's paradise? Okay, have they worked? No. Not yet, not yet. But if the robots are making all this stuff and they're in charge of, of making it, distributing it, doing the services, it can work. Okay, so I envision what I call total entitlement state. And finally, it will work in some fashion. Okay, that's necessity money. Much like we have food stamps today. And in between those two, we have luxury money. That's what you, what you get when you want to do ambitious things. I want to go on a really hot vacation. Yeah, I need luxury money. If I want to go to Disneyland, I envision that being necessity money because everybody wants to go to Disneyland. This is one of the surprise uses, okay? Artificial intelligence and more and more artificial intelligence, we're going to have cyber muses. And as you can see here, behind every great person, there is a good cyber muse. These are intelligent, self-aware entities that are designed very specifically to interact with people and inspire them. And the first versions of them are going to be, we have them already, sex toys, yay. <laughs> okay, from there we're going to, the reason for this is Emotions are very easy to understand. And because emotions are easy to understand, they're going to be easy to program for. So what's another emotion that we have? You can tell by watching Facebook. We've got the cuddly kitten emotion. Yeah. So we're going to have cuddly kitten cyber muses and related very much cute kid cyber muses, okay? So again, these are very much stroking emotions. Later, when we get much better at it, true inspiration. Okay, I'm trying to work on this problem and the cyber muse will, aha, I'm giving you what you need to solve this, the inspiration, okay? So, surprise use for artificial intelligence. Okay, I think that pretty much covers it. So. We have learned a lot about high-tech business. We've seen a vision of the future. And that's what I have for you today.